I'm Andre Bailey here on What's the Fix, the TV and radio show, talking about the opioid crisis and all things mental health uh, that are uh, related that are driving the opioid crisis. Here with Nicole Dupre. Nicole, how are you? I'm doing great. A lot of people would see you on What's the Fix, a show that has to do with opioids, and they'd be like, why is Nicole here? We right. know her from Opera del Sol as an arts advocate in the community, but we wanted to have you on today to talk a little bit about a story that people don't know about you, and that is that you are someone who's experienced loss in your family due to the opioid crisis, and I think when people hear your story, it will motivate a lot of folks to talk about their own story and get help if they need it. So, Nicole, uh, again, thanks for coming on. Thank Tell you. people out there what they might not know about your experience with the opioid crisis. Right. Um, again, thank you for this opportunity. And I'm, I'm really excited to be an advocate because for someone who experienced a loved one that was addicted to opioids, I mean, the shame, the judgment, the feeling of loneliness is something that I don't want anybody else to ever feel, you know? And the reason that a lot of people don't know the story about me is because I didn't know how to tell it, you know? I didn't know how to um, get the help that I so desperately needed for my husband at the time. Um, my husband suffered a work injury and then got addicted to the prescription pain medicine that was prescribed to him by the doctor that his job had sent him to. Um, we. I watched him. We battled his addiction for years um, until the doctor's office had closed. And then he had to turn to other means to kind of get the fix that he that he needed to, to dull that pain and to um, help the addiction. Um, and in 2017, on July 10th of 2017, um, my ex-husband, he we were divorced at the time, but died eventually of a drug overdose. People hear this and they see you and you look so normal and you, everything right. about you, people that know you, you're this community leader. And I think it's so helpful. And again, thank you so much for telling this story because how many people are just like you right. struggling in silence with this crisis? Right. I mean, when we approached you um, about possibly partnering with Project Opioid for a show that Opera del Sol was doing, um, I started to you know, really realize what the statistics were. You know, knowing that 297 people die every single day and to think how many hundreds of hundreds, if not thousands of people are feeling what I felt. I mean, I think that was the, the worst part about having someone you love that is a, first addicted to, to pain medicine that is prescribed by a doctor is that you don't you don't know what was right and you didn't know what was wrong. I think especially at the time, you know, I didn't I didn't know where to turn. There there were no resources. And um in 2012, um, on New Year's Eve, Adam suffered a drug overdose. And um, at that time, I really, you know, it was the worst moment of my life, you know, seeing your loved one on the floor and having to call 911. And what was even harder about that was the way that I was treated by the 911 operator. Mm -hmm. um, he literally was in my arms and I thought that he was going to pass away in my arms and I was yelling at the 911 operator for help. And she told me that I had to calm down or she would disconnect the phone call. Mm. So that was the first of the first point. Then we went to the emergency room and when the, he was admitted, all the emergency room technicians did was hand me forms and ask for my insurance and payment. They didn't provide me with any resources and not even a tissue as I was, you know, a mess in, in, the, in the waiting room. And so when we were released from the hospital, he went right into the house to where he had the heroin hidden and did it right in front of me. And that was when I had known, like, even though he didn't die that night, that I had truly lost my husband. And had I been given or provided some sort of information, um, even a pamphlet or a phone number or uh, uh, words of comfort. I, I I truly believe that maybe we could have we could have done something to to help him. And I there I've lived with a lot of guilt for a lot of years on what more could I have done. What's so tragic about what you're saying is we're going to have Dr. Aaron Wall on the show in in our second segment, and he will talk about he's an emergency room physician. He will talk about 
how many things could have been done right. to help Adam. How there are uh, medicines like Narcan, which, by the way, if you're listening to this, I would be remiss to not mention if you need Narcan, which is uh, a medicine that can stop an overdose, that's available at projectopioid.org right now, absolutely complimentary. But you weren't offered Narcan. You weren't told about uh, no. medicines that could help you, like buprenorphine, which is a, a new uh, a drug that's being used on the opioid crisis mm -hmm. to help someone who is struggling with these opioids. You were given none of this help, yeah. and you were given what you felt like was a lot of judgment in oh. all, all, right all along the way. And Nicole, what again is just so heartbreaking is there's so many people that struggle with drugs in our society. Right. But on the opioid crisis, Adam got on these opioids from prescriptions from his doctor. Right. He was not scoring drugs mm -hmm. uh, off the street. And, it's, and by the way, some people, you know, wind up doing that. And I'm not making a judgment about that. But that wasn't his story. Not in the beginning, no. So, so I think so many people, Nicole, relate to what you're saying. So many people in our community are struggling with opioids. They're struggling uh, uh, with mental health issues that maybe, you know, dr drive that crisis. But in addition to that, how many of them seek help or need help like you did and find very little? Right. Um, that was that I think that that was the biggest um, hurdle for me at the time is, you know, the the behavioral changes first, you know what I mean? That was, you know, here I am a young newlywed, you know, with my husband and he he changed, you know, I mean, prescription painkillers can make you mean they can change your personality. Um, they can make you lie. They can make you um, just, again, just turn you into a completely different person. And in the beginning, you know, it was like, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big guy. I have to take this many, you know. Um, you know, he had old injuries from weightlifting and bodybuilding and, and you know, boxing in, in, in his earlier days that it was, oh, it's an injury. I need this. I need this. And when there was no other um, information given to me at first, it was like, well, if the doctor knows, the doctor knows, right? And then, you know, he was a laborer. So, so many of his coworkers were suffering through the same thing. Again, the more, the more that he worked, the more money he could bring home. And we were newlyweds trying to start a family, trying to buy a home. So I almost didn't, it was very easy to overlook in the beginning when you don't know what necessarily are the signs, where, where did it stop from being something that he he physically needed to because of his injuries to then being physically dependent on them because of the addiction. Nicole, if someone's out there and they're listening to this, they, they've kind of uh, scrolled through the stations, the channels, and they hear your story and they're struggling with opioids and they might be in a similar situation. What's like the one piece of advice or, or, or one or two pieces of advice you would give someone out there that hears your story and they can relate to it? I think you're not alone. You know, the face of opioid addiction is not what, you know, we were we were taught what a drug what a drug addict looked like, right? You know, growing up in the eighties, we we're seeing, you know, the the you know, the crack cocaine and, and cops, right? You know, they're they're all these dirty junkies, right? And so I just want people to know that the faces of opioid addiction look like me. You know, they look, you know, the average person that is dying is under forty years old. You know, so this is something that is affecting such a large percentage that I just want people to know that they're not alone. And then I hope that as a society, we're starting to change the way that we we um, place judgment and shame on those that are hurting, you know, because it's not just about the physical pain. You know, a lot of drug addicts are, are taking things to numb an, an emotional, the emotional pain. So. Um, if we can, what I want to do is to make sure that, you know, people know that there is help. There are people to talk to. You don't have to be alone. You know, with the powers of the Internet, you know, you can you can connect with people online. You can you, there are numbers to call and um, places to go. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this on WKMG, I want to encourage you right now. Uh, don't just hear Nicole's story if you're struggling and not do something about it. Like right. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you out there right now. No, no, not that other person, you right now. I want you, if you're struggling with mental health issues, if you're struggling with addiction, if you're struggling with opioids, and I know maybe you're not talking to people about it, 
go to our website right now, projectopioid.org, you're going to see all kinds of resources available. We have a stop campaign that we've put out where you can learn about how you can stop an overdose for you or a family member. We have mental health uh, resources available. Get counseling. I know that's a four-letter word to some people, but get counseling if you need it. And more than anything, be a part of the conversation that helps other people break their own stigma and reach out for help. Nicole, I know I haven't always felt great the last couple months. The the last couple months have been some of the most trying times in American history, in the history of our community. Mm -hmm. And I know for those out there that were struggling with addiction before, struggling with opioids before, this is a moment that might be scary. And we might see, if we're not careful, the greatest wave of mental health, addiction, and, and overdose crisis in our history if we don't get people help. So, Nicole, we're so excited to have you on board. How can people get a hold of you if they want to get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, and please reach out to me. If you feel like you you want to connect with somebody who's been through it, feel free to email me. It's Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, at projectopioid.org. Um, I'd be happy to kind of hear your story. If you need resources, go to projectopioid.org. Um, uh, and, yeah, I, I would love to be able to lend my voice and um, – and any words of comforting, you know, comfort that I may be able to provide, not to, to somebody who is suffering from addiction, because I know, I know that if you are addicted and you're out there and you're listening, the hardest part of anything is admitting, is admitting that you have a problem. And, but if you know someone who is addicted and you don't know how you can help, I mean, just, just reach out and I would love to be able to provide some, some, some sort of comfort. Yeah, Nicole's story is heartbreaking. Uh, because of the loss of um, her, her late ex-husband. But it's also heartbreaking to hear the perspective of a family member who was along for the ride, mm-hmm. on that ride of addiction, that ride of overdoses, and ultimately watching him pass away from an overdose. How many family members are out there listening to this right now mm-hmm. saying, what can I do? We want to get those folks all the, they might not be struggling. They might not be addicted to opioids, but we can equip them to help their loved one and get their loved one help. That starts with a stop. That starts with a stop. And that's stopping a minute to get Narcan, to learn about Narcan. And you can do that on our website, projectopioid.org. You can get Narcan delivered to you for free if you're in a dangerous situation right now, projectopioid.org. Nicole, we're going to be hearing a lot more from you. We appreciate all that you're doing for the community. And uh, we'll be back in just a minute with Dr. Aaron Wall to talk more about the medical uh, advancements that have been made on the opioid crisis. Stay tuned. We're back on What's the Fix? I'm here with Dr. Aaron Wall, an emergency room physician who has seen far too many times Nicole's story play out right in front of you. For those of you that are just joining us, we heard from Nicole Dupre a second ago, a young lady who one of her family members got on opioids from a doctor and then had never used opioids before, wound up in this cycle where he got very little help, got very addicted, and began overdosing and eventually died. Dr. Wall, you see this all the time. Can society do anything about this, or do we have to just put up with these overdoses that are happening all around us? No, absolutely not. Um, Certainly not. We can't just put up with it. Uh, There are numerous options uh, for people who are suffering from opioid use disorder, uh, like Nicole's uh, husband uh, passed. Um, Number one is, really, we need to get all these patients better access to medication-assisted treatment. It's also known as medications for opioid use disorder now, um, and that's the primary methodology with which we're treating these patients. Um, We previously were sort of offering them counseling, and counseling is a fantastic adjunct to these medications, but the main message that I'm trying to get across is we need to have increased access to these medications for these patients I believe it could have uh, saved Nicole's husband's life uh, if he were offered these medications, but yet um, far too few of these patients are offered these medications. So one of the medications that, that we talk about often on What's the Fix 
is Narcan, naloxone. That a lot of people have heard of this, and by the way, you can get Narcan naloxone at projectopioid.org at no cost. But the reason that we're making it available is folks listening out there, they might not know how many lives are being saved uh, by people being distributed and then using Narcan when someone's overdosing. Is that something people should learn and know about if they've never heard of it? Absolutely. I think that Narcan should be widely distributed uh, almost on the scale of AEDs. These are external defibrillators that are found in airports and shopping malls and um, restaurants. Uh, I believe that Narcan should be uh, as available as uh, those units. Um, the medication is easily obtainable uh, through um, some, uh, you, you don't really need a prescription. Uh, in fact, through Project Opioid, I wrote the standing order for all the prescriptions. I don't have to view the patient to have the prescription. And so they can obtain this. It's very easy to obtain and very easy to carry it around. And the patient or the patient's loved one or friends, uh, anybody that they're using with uh, can immediately uh, just simply spray it in the nostril of the patient that is assumed to be um, overdosing, uh, and they will immediately be revived with enough time uh, to obtain a phone call to 911 and then bring them to an emergency department where they can be monitored for a few hours. Also, hopefully in the emergency department, then they're offered further treatment options for their opioid use disorder, such as medication-assisted treatment, such as Suboxone or Buprenorphine, or they can be referred even to a clinic uh, such as a methadone clinic as well. Uh, Dr. Wall, a lot of people here, you talk about all these different medicines, most of which they've never heard of. And uh, so I'll, I'll interpret this for the, the layperson out there. If your uh, husband, like Nicole's husband that we heard from earlier, got addicted to these opioids, whatever way, there are people that get addicted from their doctor. They, they were over prescriptions of opioids in this country. It's well documented. We all know that story. Doctors wrote too many scripts for a lot of years, didn't realize how dangerous opioids were or didn't care. I think most people out there know that story. But I don't think they know how many young people get addicted to opioids, people 40 years old and, and under, just as a party drug. Opioids passed around as a party drug. There, people take them from medicine cabinets, and opioids have become a very popular drug, uh, a street drug, if you will. But Dr. Wall, no matter how people get dependent on opioids, if you're dependent on opioids, it's not like trying to stop eating too much pizza. It's not like trying to, you know, not drink the coffee you drink every morning. Opioids are incredibly physically addicting and for someone to get off opioids without one of these medicines that you were just talking about, that can be incredibly, incredibly hard. For some people, impossible. So uh, what you're saying is that medicines have been created to help people on that journey. That's absolutely right. Um, what we've noticed and, and seen in the literature, it's uh, backed by evidence, is, is that a patient who uses opioids for even three to four weeks continually um, actually develops some rewiring of their brain chemistry. That's the best way to explain it. And the areas of our brain that we use for normal judgment to say what's right or wrong or unsafe, or maybe that's a dangerous position I'm putting myself into, those areas are sort of disconnected. Uh, and the patient begins to think with some of the more primitive aspects of their brain, which is our fight or flight response. A lot of people will say sort of colloquially, oh, it's the lizard brain. And that is, you know, where's food? How do I reproduce? Fight or flight? And then honestly, it becomes how do I avoid withdrawal? So they're not thinking with their logical uh, reasoning area of their brain. They're only thinking with their primitive area of their brain. So for us to say, just stop doing drugs, or you need to just stop, it's physically impossible for many of them to do that. Maybe less than eight to 10% can do it with just counseling and sort of a narcotics uh, or a 12 narcotics anonymous or a 12 step approach. Uh, but the other large majority, almost 90%, really need medication to get on the medication to continue it for a year or even two years or even three years. And that way they can basically be much more open to the counseling and the development of emotional resilience that can eventually have them come off the drug totally. Dr. Wall, I can hear some of the people out there in radio and TV land right now listening to you going, Oh, someone's struggling on drugs, so we give them another drug. This is always the solution 
to our problems in society. I've heard you say this before, and I think it's a good point. We don't judge people if they have high blood pressure for taking a high blood pressure medication. We see medicine as an incredibly important part of so many uh, things that ail us in our society. Why do you think people have such a judgment and stigma against people getting medicine, medications, FDA-approved medications, to help them when they're struggling with addiction? Because of the stigma, sincerely, um, numerous people, lay people, feel that if a person begins using, it was by choice, and therefore that's their choice, and they say that the patient just continues to make bad choices. What really is the truth is the patient's environment often puts them in a position where they're exposed to opioids. Once they're exposed to opioids and use for three, four, five weeks, then they get this rewiring of their brain chemistry, and now we're talking about a real physiologic disease process much like diabetes or hypertension. The other issue is, is that we also stigmatize the medications that we use to treat opioid use disorder, and that is buprenorphine, suboxone, or even methadone. Even though these have been proven to diminish fatality by 60%, once we just get them on the medication, there's an 80% reduction in uh, crime associated with them trying to find their medications. Um, and lastly, it allows them to function on a very normal basis. They're not walking around high or intoxicated. They're actually functioning. They're driving cars, they're driving trucks, there's lawyers, there's doctors, and there's nurses on these medications. Uh, so it's very important to destigmatize what these medications are for the patients. Another interesting point is that we consider we're trading one addiction for another. That's what you'll hear the public say a lot of times. Lay people will say in a very judgmental manner. But I'm trying to communicate that when a patient is addicted to a medication, they continually and compulsively use despite negative social consequences. The difference between addiction and dependence is most of us are dependent on coffee. That means we have to have our coffee or we'll get headaches, we'll have mild caffeine withdrawal. Are we addicted? No, we are not. We are dependent. What's the difference? The difference is coffee doesn't cause us any negative social consequences. So what are the negative social consequences associated with heroin or opioid use disorder? It is IV injections, street drug harms, obtaining harms. Uh, sometimes people turn to selling themselves to obtain the medications. Of course, they're intoxicated at work. Those are all negative social consequences. If we can get them on a medication that's metered, and very steady and keep them on a very uh, steady, stable dose, then there's no negative social consequences associated with that. They're not injecting anymore. They're not driving intoxicated anymore. Uh, they're not showing up to work intoxicated. Again, their relationships normalize and they become a productive member of society again. So we aren't trading one addiction for another. We're putting them on a medication that keeps them on that stable medication, they're dependent on it for a number of years until they can develop, like I said, that emotional resilience and that sort of internal fortitude to come off of the medication. They also have to be somewhat taken out of their environment that put them in that, um, sort of predisposed them to use in the first place. And that's what that whole network is that, you know, helps with the counseling. I would love for uh, medication-assisted treatment to be utilized with the 12 steps, that would be even more revolutionary, and there's a very few areas where that's happening, uh, but that would be the ultimate, you know, sort of ideal solution. And so I just want to recap again that if you're out there struggling with opioids, you're out there with mental health issues that could drive you and have driven you to addiction before, go to our website right now, projectopioid.org, Stop a minute, go to that site, and number one, get yourself Narcan. Uh, it's for free. It's complimentary through a partnership that we've put together on our website, projectopioid.org. Do that. Take a minute to make um, that a part of uh, your medicine cabinet. Carry it in your purse. Have it in case someone around you, a loved one, uh, is struggling with opioids and would need that intervention. So number one, get yourself Narcan. We'll make that available to you. Number two... If you're listening to this and you're struggling with opioids, a family member is struggling with opioids, especially you who are listening and it's a family member, 
get familiar with the things Dr. Wall is talking about. He just threw a bunch of stuff out you, at you. You probably don't really understand it. But your gap between understanding all of the new medical m medications that are available to you or a loved one could be the difference between life and death for you or that loved one. So go to our website. We're going to have Dr. Wall on there with some videos where he talks about all these different medicines that could be available to you. Your doctor could prescribe many of them to you. It's really not that hard to get medication-assisted treatment, and Dr. Wall will have uh, some information on our website about that. And, and last but not least, we got to talk about these things as a society. If, if you're listening to this and you're struggling, I beg you, reach out for help. Talk to family members. And Dr. Wall, we've got to get people open. To, we got to break. I know we hear this all the time. It's almost trite, but we got to break the stigma around addiction. And it's imperative. It's imperative. And especially how someone should feel when they need help. What you're saying is if you're out there, you're struggling with opioids, there are ways that a doctor can help you. And so I'll give you the last word. If someone's out there struggling right now, they've got a family member that's struggling with opioids as one of the top experts on this subject, what should they do? I would say absolutely advocate for yourself or your loved one if they are involved and they are addicted or have opioid use disorder and they are using opioids. If they are in treatment for addiction for that, I would absolutely push you to push the treatment provider to provide for MAT. I want to say that... MAT, I, again, would be... Medication-assisted treatment. So what's... Buprenorphine, which is also known as Suboxone, and or Methadone. Okay. And I'm, I'm pleading with you, for your family member or yourself, to reach out and ask for that specific treatment as part of your addiction treatment regimen. That's the most important thing. That's what's going to save your life until you can overcome this medical disease process. Um, I want to urge caregivers uh, and those that provide treatment to remember to please drop the stigma. Patients come to us for treatment and not for judgment. Uh, and we're in an honorable profession and we have to look beyond uh, any sort of stigma that we have towards the patient and reach out and offer them these medications. If someone dies in the United States of America and they're under 40 years old, the number one cause of death is opioid-related overdose. That, that's absolutely right. That, that That is staggering, and that's what we're trying to do is reach out and say, hey, if you need help, get help. One more time, go to projectopioid.org. Stop a minute, get Narcan, and if that's not something you feel like you need, stop a minute and learn about not only Narcan, but medications that are available for someone struggling with opioids. We've got to get beyond judgment and foolishness when it comes to addiction and help people understand that they can talk about mental health issues, they can talk about addiction, they can talk about the fact they're struggling with opioids, and that there's a community that will help them and not judge them. Aaron Wall, thank you. We'll be talking to you again soon. And uh, if you're out there, projectopioid.org. We'll see you soon. Thank you.